Hello, welcome to Introduction to Neonatal Enteral Nutrition. I am Selena Callen, Manager of Nutrition Services at Akron Children's Hospital. I am also the current chair of the neonatal section for Aspen, the American Society of Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition. I have no financial or commercial disclosures. Upon completion of this video, the learner will be able to assess neonatal nutrition status and growth, identify enteral feeding substrates and their benefits, describe considerations in enteral feeding progression and protocols, there will be a full list of references at the end of the presentation. The role of the neonatal dietitian in enteral nutrition includes the following. Assesses nutrition status, determines nutrition needs, monitors and assesses growth, determines optimal enteral feeding substrate and calorie concentration, and manages enteral feeding advancement. First, we'll talk about nutrition assessment. Weight, length, and head circumference are typical anthropometrics used to assess neonatal nutrition. Weights are often measured daily, while head circumference and length are often measured weekly. All infants lose weight after birth and often have regained their birth weight by 7 to 14 days of life. Typical weight gain goals for infants are as follows. 15 to 16 grams per kilo per day for infants under 2 kilos, and 25 to 35 grams per day for infants 2 kilos and greater. Plotting anthropometrics on a growth chart is an important tool in nutrition assessment. For infants born at 36 and 6 sevenths or less, a preterm specific growth chart should be used, such as the Fenton or Olson growth charts. The goal with growth is to help infants maintain their own specific curve. This means avoiding plateaus as well as rapid and excessive gains. Literature shows that both poor and excessive weight gain can have negative health impacts. When assessing neonatal nutrition, it is important to be aware of potential malnutrition. Causes of neonatal malnutrition may include poor nutrient provision in utero, prematurity, inadequate nutrition after birth. In 2018, Goldberg et al. published preterm and neonatal malnutrition recommendations. These indicators are to be used for preterm infants born before 37 weeks and for neonates born at 37 weeks or greater with a current age of 28 days or younger. Similar to the published pediatric malnutrition indicators, there are indicators that require one indicator to diagnose malnutrition and indicators that require two indicators. The indicators that require only one are decline in weight for age disease score, weight gain velocity, and nutrient intake. The indicators requiring two are days to regain birth weight, linear growth velocity, and decline in length for age disease score. Next, we'll move on to discussing enteral nutrition. Listed here are the enteral calorie and protein goals for preterm, late preterm, and term infants. Calorie and protein goals are higher for preterm infants than term infants as the preterm infants have less time in utero to accrue nutrient stores. These goals are a good starting point. Aim to provide nutrition to meet these goals and then adjust as needed based on growth. Micronutrient goals are also higher in preterm infants since the majority of micronutrient accrual occurs in the third trimester. For enteral feeding substrates, there are a few options. The first choice will always be mother's own milk. This is the gold standard for feeding any infant, especially a preterm infant. Donor milk is another option to consider when mother's own milk is of insufficient volume to meet the infant's needs or is not available. Donor milk is pasteurized, donated human milk. It's important to note that while it can be a good option, it is not equivalent to mother's own breast milk. Infant formulas are also options. There are many varieties of formula available. Some of the characteristics that distinguish them are the gestational age of the infant they are designed for, as well as the protein type. 
Human milk, including mother's own milk and donor milk, are the ideal options when available. There are many health benefits of feeding human milk, including, but not limited to, decreased risk of necrotizing enterocolitis, or NEC, with an exclusive human milk diet, potential for improved neurodevelopmental outcomes, decreased risk of respiratory infections, gastroenteritis, asthma, obesity, and diabetes, and many more. While human milk is the best thing to feed preterm infants, human milk alone does not meet their micronutrient needs. Human milk fortifiers are products made to add to human milk to increase the nutrient content. They are specifically designed for use in preterm infants. They add calcium, phosphorus, protein, calories, and other nutrients. There are multiple brands and types on the market, and each has a very different nutrient profile. There are two types of protein origins currently available, cow's milk or human milk. When it comes to infant formulas, there are many options. Each formula is designed for patients of a particular age. Preterm infant formulas are for use in preterm infants. They have the highest protein, calcium, and phosphorus content. They're available for in-hospital use only and are not sold in the retail setting. They come as ready-to-feed liquids in 20, 24, and 30 calorie per ounce. Nutrient-enriched formulas are designed for preterm infants to transition to for discharge home. They are available in the retail setting as well as in the hospital and come in standard concentration of 22 calories per ounce. They are available as both liquid and powders. These formulas have less calcium and phosphorus than preterm formulas, but more than term formulas. Term infant formulas have nutrient profile designed for term infants. There are a large variety of term formulas. Protein type is a common way to categorize them. The options include standard cow's milk based intact protein formulas, partially hydrolyzed protein, elemental, and soy protein formulas. It's important to note that soy formulas are contraindicated for use in preterm infants. The calcium and phosphorus is less bioavailable in these formulas, which makes them less than ideal for preterm infants who are already at risk for deficit of calcium and phosphorus. To maintain enteral feeding safety, use of sterile liquid products for preterm infants is recommended whenever possible in order to decrease risk or potential infection from contaminated powders. Preterm formulas are available as sterile liquids as well as some nutrient-enriched and term formulas. Sterile liquid human milk fortifiers are also available. Follow the published guidelines for safe formula and breast milk preparation and handling practices. When providing enteral nutrition, another important factor to consider is the type of available enteral access. There are two factors to consider in enteral access the point of entry, and placement of the distal tip of the tube. For short-term access, there are nasogastric and nasojejunal tubes, which enter through the nose into the stomach or small intestine. Another short-term option is orogastric or orojejunal tubes, which enter through the mouth into the stomach or small intestine. When longer-term access is needed, there are a few options. A gastrostomy tube is implanted through the wall of the stomach with the tip ending in the stomach. Similarly, a jejunostomy tube is implanted through the wall of the stomach but with the tip ending in the small intestine. Finally, a gastrojejunal tube is implanted through the wall of the stomach with two tips, one ending in the stomach and one in the small intestine. There are many factors in enteral feeding strategy. A common recommendation is to bolus feed into the stomach whenever possible. Many NICUs have feeding protocols. While there is great variation in protocols, literature shows that just having a standardized feeding protocol in place has been shown to decrease the risk of NEC. Each enteral feeding protocol needs to address three types of feeding strategies. Timing of initiation of enteral feeds. 
Starting enteral feeds before day of life four has been shown not to increase the risk of neck. Rate of enteral feeding advancement. Literature shows that advancement of 30 mLs per kilo per day did not increase risk of neck. And finally, timing of human milk fortification. Literature shows that starting fortification at less than 100 milliliters per kilo per day of enteral feed had little to no effect on risk of neck. Here is an example of an enteral feeding protocol from a published article. You can see how it designates when to start enteral feeds, what volume to start at, as well as the rate of advancement. This is only one example. As you investigate more feeding protocols, you will notice significant differences in each one. There is no one definitively proven best enteral feeding protocol. When providing enteral feeds, it is important to monitor the infant for signs of feeding intolerance. Some common signs could include, but are not limited to, blood in the stool. This can be an early sign of neck. Increase in frequency of or volume of emesis. Increase in frequency of or change to a more liquid stool consistency. And abdominal distension. While enteral feeds are advancing, often parenteral nutrition is being weaned. There are well-documented challenges in achieving adequate nutrition during the transition from parenteral to enteral nutrition. This is often called the transition phase. Inadequate nutrition during this time can result in growth below the expected goal. There are some ways that nutrient delivery can be improved during this transition. One way is to increase the rate of advancement of enteral feedings, aiding in reaching the enteral feeding goal quicker. Earlier fortification of enteral feeds can also help to provide increased nutrition. Another strategy is to concentrate the contents of the parenteral nutrition as much as possible as the volume of parenteral nutrition decreases. This allows for maximal delivery of nutrition in the decreasing volume of parenteral nutrition. In summary, the neonatal dietitian plays an important role in optimizing nutrition delivery through enteral feedings. Some takeaways to remember in practice include the following. Assess growth using anthropometrics frequently, at least weekly. Neonatal-specific malnutrition assessment indicators are available. Preterm infants should be plotted on preterm-specific growth charts. Human milk, and ideally mother's own breast milk, is the ideal substrate for enteral feedings. Use of human milk fortifiers added to human milk are crucial to deliver adequate nutrition. If using infant formula, choose the appropriate formula based on the nutrient content and the protein type. Be aware of the enteral access type available. Deliver bolus feeds into the stomach whenever possible. Monitor enteral feeding tolerance. And lastly, optimize nutrition during the transition phase. Here are the references for this presentation. In closing, this educational offering was provided to you by Aspen and supported by an educational grant from Reckitt Mead Johnson Nutrition. Thank you for joining us today.